thank you very much for the invitation to fulfill this role. Uh, we've had three excellent presentations. Uh, I don't disagree with, I disagree with very little that's been said. Uh, what I'll try and do is sort of synthesize a little bit and maybe point out a couple of issues in terms of taking this agenda of work forward. Now, th though the session was called Poverty and Inequality in Africa, the focus has been very much inequality. And that's entirely right. We know much more about poverty. We know much less about inequality. And as Arun pointed out, inequality in Africa is higher on average than other parts of the world. And we need to understand this, and it's really important. And the point about the growth elasticity of poverty being so low in Africa is almost certainly linked to that high inequality. So it's a really important issue. Two of the presentations we had basically used international data and basically asked questions about what are the causes of high inequality. Uh, Andrea and Haroon differently, but really addressed those sort of questions. These questions are fundamentally important. What is the factor underlying high inequality in Africa? Kathleen's presentation focused much more on measurement, but also focused on a rather uh, some, some additional perspectives on inequality. That's also really important. All of these things are really important issues moving forward. Now, the measurement issue is absolutely fundamental. The data quality, it, despite the best efforts of WID and other things, the quality of inequality data for Africa remains poor. That is the fact, that is the reality that we have to face. To add to it are the problems that Kathleen talked about, about surveys not being comparable. It's been a continual source of frustration to me in using things like PovCalNet and World Development Indicators. You can't judge whether data is comparable or not. That's a, major disservice to, that's a major disservice to the development community that you just can't understand which data are comparable and, and which not without looking into it much more carefully. Or rather, that's telling you that you need to check out much more carefully before just using data from an existing data source. And of course, as Kathleen says, inequality is often inadequately measured. Now, the response to this, I think, is not to make up lots of new observations in the way of SWID, based on what are already weak data to start with. The response, I think, is to try and get, improve the quality of the underlying data. Now, let's just think for a minute about the suitability of the household surveys we, we have for measuring inequality. The household surveys have been very much motivated by poverty measurement. The focus of the surveys is very much in measuring consumption and very much in the consumption items of poor households because the interest is on, folk, is on poverty. But rich households consume different things. For rich households, actually, we might be more interested in income than we are in consumption. That might be a much more relevant thing to ask. And of course, rich households are the ones that are least likely to answer the questionnaire, the ones that are least likely to respond. And OK, we find replacement households and even re-weight, you're still going to end up underestimating inequality. So are the surveys that we use to measure poverty really a good source to try to measure inequality? What else might we be able to do? For example, can we use other sources to try to get at some of the top incomes. Kathleen talked about the um, extreme wealth. On the state of inequality in Africa, well, um, what can we say? Well, certainly that there are some very high inequality cases. That's, sh that's clear, Harun's seven outliers. Certainly the low poverty elasticity of growth, uh, no question about that. And that there's a lot of inequality and increasing inequality between countries as well as within countries. Those things, I think, are clear. What is less clear is the trend in inequality. So with the international data, Andrea and, and, and Haroon were, were sort of suggesting that maybe inequality might be falling. But actually, I'm not sure how robust that actually is. And Kathleen, I think, uh, cautions against drawing any conclusions about that. Everyone agrees that there's a huge diversity in inequality experiences, and that, I think, is the point we should agree on. There's a lot of diversity. There are increases. There are reductions. There are 
you, uh, upward U, uh, um, U shapes and inverted U shapes and everything. The focus on what are the causes of inequality in Africa, I think, is really important. Natural resource dependence almost comes as number one. It's a really important issue. And this is not just a matter of how well the natural resources are managed. Botswana is often an example of a country which has well managed its natural resources. It's still among the seven top countries. Natural resource dependence seems to be associated with, with high inequality. Lack of structural transformation is almost certainly another part of the story. Maybe the limited progress or the slower progress in post-primary education and all kinds of other things that are there. We want to understand how those things uh, influence the level of inequality. But we shouldn't just be interested in the level of inequality. We should be interested in the changes. We should be interested in the reductions in inequality. Where there's reductions in inequality, what caused that? What, what, and also, even before we get there, inequality falls. Is this a sustained change? Or is it just the information you have for the two patterns of time where you actually have data? If you had a bad harvest in one year and a good harvest in another year, inequality could come down, measured inequality could come down, simply because of that. It's not something which can necessarily be extrapolated. Kathleen's inequality of opportunities, and Chico and others have worked a lot on this, I think that's a really key factor. And this idea that children are managing to get higher levels of education than their parents and starting to do different jobs from what their parents are doing, I think is really important. But is this still telling us that inequality of opportunity is falling? Don't we need to know about what the, what's happening among poorer households and among richer households? Is this catch-up happening equally everywhere in the distribution or not? And finally, just in terms of uh, some uh, future issues, the point about understanding what data is robust and comparable remains important. Understanding the cause of high inequality and changes in inequality, I think, is really important. Non-monetary inequality. We talk about poverty being multidimensional. Inequality, we should also think of as being, uh, as being multidimensional as well. Non-monetary inequality is also very important. Now, that's less clear how to do because a lot of our non-monetary measures are often zero-one measures. But there may be ways of doing it, and even with DHS data and asset quintiles and so on, we can start to understand some patterns of non-monetary inequality. The inequality of opportunity agenda, I think, is a really important one and one that's worth taking forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andy, for a, a clear, comprehensive, and brief uh, discussion. Excellent. So this now uh, allows us still to have about 10 minutes or so uh, for questions. Let me start with uh, Professor Eric Thor back here, and then I'll take the two at the back. I'll, I'll take them in groups of three. Thank you very much for three excellent uh, presentations. My uh, first question is for Kathleen, and uh, the uh, uh, surveys, whether they're consumption surveys or income surveys, typically do not take into account the imputed value of public uh, benefits received by households. If this were the case, my guess is that it would increase inequality in the sense that some of the non-poor households may receive a larger share of the, of the benefits. So that's another way of looking at uh, inequality. Um, secondly, uh, when you looked at uh, uh, service deliveries or the, the quality of education, uh, and I, you, you had a, uh, 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 evidence on Uganda, I noticed that it stopped in 1990, and a number of your other graphs also stopped around 1990. And I find it uh, surprising. Uh, the other day I was trying to get uh, recent evidence on service deliveries in Africa recently, and it's extremely difficult to get this kind of information. And it seems to me that uh, maybe the World Bank and uh, AERC might work uh, on, on doing this. Finally, 
I do have a, uh, um, a question for Haroon. Uh, you did not uh, mention uh, the uh, structural transformation, uh, particularly in terms of what is happening between agriculture and other sectors. Uh, and we all know that uh, prior to uh, 2000, the structural transformation in Africa tended to be flawed in the sense that uh, workers moving out of agriculture would end up uh, in jobs that were even less productive in the informal sector. More recent evidence, uh, I've uh, looked at 14 countries, seems to indicate that structural transformation, even though these workers out of agriculture did not go into manufacturing, was much more successful. They would take jobs that were more productive, and this is one of the reasons for the uh, uh, high macro growth in Africa. So it seems to me that you might want to say something about this uh, structural transformation. Thank you, Eric. I had two people at the back, the gentleman at the very back, and then that second one there. Uh, and then we'll do a second round after that. Uh, thank you so much. My question is to Andrea Konya, but also maybe to all the panelists. Uh, the best situation, I think everyone would agree on that, is that if we have growth which is pro-poor, growth which is accompanied by the reduction of inequalities. But in real life, usually it doesn't happen. If not for Africa, then for the whole world, usually the growth is accompanied by some increase in inequalities. The case in point is China. You take people out of poverty because of growth, but also there is an increase in inequality. So it's like the price to pay for growth. And judging by the data that were shown today uh, in Africa, some fast-growing economies like Mauritius, Botswana, Ghana, maybe South Africa, they also experience the rise in inequality. So the question is, uh, what is the general framework to make a judgment whether it's acceptable and to what extent is acceptable? There is a UNDP Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index. Uh, what is your attitude to that and what is the framework, how we can discuss it? To what extent this increase in inequality is acceptable as a price for growth? Thank you. Thank you. I've been remiss in not asking uh, people to introduce themselves. So if the next ones could, uh, this is the gentleman there, could introduce yourself and, and be brief, please, with your question. Yes. Hello. Thank you. My Daniel Waldenström, Uppsala University, Sweden. Um, so I was uh, wondering a little bit about the role of institutions. It was kind of mentioned, but perhaps I was a little, I would have thought that uh, the role of institutions would have been emphasized a little bit more, especially when it comes to the, the role of uh, manufacturing and, and perhaps why we don't see more of that. Uh, there are papers showing, for example, papers by Ray Fiesman in, at Columbia that countries with a high degree of protection of property rights also receive dispropor disproportionately much uh, FDI, FDI flows. So. Overall, the role of institutions, uh, property rights, governance, I think, is more uh, among the deeper drivers of, of development rather than the more mediating or intermediate drivers such as the, the manufacturing outcome as such. So uh, that, that would be interesting to hear more about. Thank you. So I'm not sure we'll have time for a second round, so let me take the lady here who had a, uh, indicated that she wanted to ask a question now as well, and then we'll go to the panel. Thank you, and thank you for very interesting presentations. My name is True Shedvin. I work at CEDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. Uh, my question uh, is, is uh, very much related to the first uh, question on the patterns of the structural transformation that we're seeing, uh, a movement from agriculture more into services sector than to manufacturing. And I also wanted to just make references to what was discussed this morning in the panel of, of thinking new and of uh, finding kind of solutions that are suitable in, in Africa. Um, and I'm thinking, my question is, could it be that we underestimate the productivity of the services sector? So hence we underestimate the, the possibility, the potential of the services sector to play the role that the manufacturing sector has uh, historically played in uh, <clears throat> growing economies and reducing poverty and inequality. Thanks. Thanks. So with that, let's go back to the panel um, to comment on the questions that were addressed specifically to each speaker, but also feel free to address more general ones if you like. Let's go in the same order, perhaps. Uh, 
Thank you for your comment, Eric. Uh, I, we, it is correct that our consumption-based inequality measures don't account for the use of publicly provided services like health, education, even sanitation. And I, uh, in my experience, I think intuitively it would definitely lead to greater inequality, particularly on the spatial dimension, because you know we know that these services are concentrated in urban areas which already have an advantage. Uh, I have to think more about how we can potentially incorporate that into some measurement, because sometimes we have that information in household surveys, and if we can potentially put a price tag on it, we might be able to see how much it affects it. Uh, so as I just mentioned, we sometimes have information on to what extent households are using publicly provided services from our household questionnaires, but it's often not very detailed. Uh, the World Bank does have a effort to uh, a program called the Service Deliveries Indicators <laughs> Program, which is operating in, a, in several countries, more on the quality of the supply side of publicly provided services. So issues like teacher absenteeism, whether or not health workers are giving good information and, and showing up on time. Um, but it hasn't really linked up to the household survey side, so that's something for us to explore. I'll make one comment, not not related to my presentation, but a, a topic close to heart on the, the last comment from the, um, the lady from CETA. You know, I'm, uh, I think one thing that one area on a measurement, on a data side, where we really haven't, I think, figured out what to do is how to unpack the service sector. Because in, I think in most countries in Africa, a huge part of the service sector are very small micro enterprises. And it's quite different than what maybe we think of from a Western perspective on what the service sector is and could be. Um, so I, I would like to, I would hope that in, you know, in another 10 years time when there's another a wider UNU conference that we could talk about not the service sector, but you know, type A, type B, type C in Africa and what it means. Thank you. All right. um, thanks very much. Um, so the, in fact, that's right. The, the, the first and the last question were both uh, about structural transformation and the extent to which we may have underestimated the role of services. So there's a couple of comments. First, there is a wider project that's just been launched. Uh, uh, John Page uh, is not here. OK, he's in the other. Uh, it's not the title, but uh, the, the title of the project that I've warped is Growth Without Smokestacks, um, which is an attempt to understand whether we can get growth uh, in Africa without manufacturing as its core, as its lifeblood. Um, I think there is a data issue. Um, certainly from the employment numbers, uh, the evidence, say, from Kenya and Juguna is here, shows that despite massive growth in financial services, the employment effects are relatively small when you compare it, say, to the urban informal sector type employment. So as an inequality reducing channel, um, uh, rather than uh, productivity gains, I think you may get slightly different results. But I, but I agree that there, there is a really important question about whether you can do development uh, outside of the Roderick view of development, right? So can you get uh, growth in development uh, and inequality and all the good stuff uh, without manufacturing being front and center? Um, uh, and and th that, by implication, is the role of services. So, but uh, but just to quickly emphasize what uh, Kathleen said, I think the data issue. We keep on talking about it, but I, but really, it's about things like statistical capacity, the political economy of access, uh, resource allocation. I'll just leave you with one final point. In in, in our meeting yesterday, the largest economy in in Africa, Nigeria, cannot give us unit record labor force survey data. Right, and these are researchers who have access to the statistician general and so on, but they, we cannot get unit record data to, to count the numbers of people working in Africa's largest economy. Um, sorry, finally about the institutions, I think the two are linked. So you'll find that you, you need, you need um, uh, uh, Chico's done some great thinking around the role of infrastructure and the paucity of infrastructure and why it undermines manufacturing competitiveness. But in addition to that, in order to improve manufacturing competitiveness, property rights, governance, also important. Okay, now, first one on the data issue. I mean, I think that we, we really strive. I mean, I, I'm the founder of the World Income Inequality Database of WIDA, which has been updated and so on and so forth. And then for Africa, there are still some uh, comparability problems, like uh, Kathleen mentioned. But the World Bank, uh, uh, is still, I think, uh, working on this I2D2 
database, which I don't know what it means. But uh, basically, they take the, the microdata for 300. Uh, ah, okay. The, the World Bank uh, is working on this I2D2 database in which they take the single surveys and they try to make a standard statistical assumption for processing this data. So that might reduce the, the estimation bias. And, um, and we have been looking as part of this project to, we have written a paper on the seven sins of inequality measurement in which uh, we mentioned that. Now, these I2D2 data are available on, only at least to us for, I don't know, 20, uh, 20 or 30 services, uh, services have been processed. And uh, fortunately, the numbers that came out in 80 or 90% of the cases were very similar to the one which we used. So, um, so while we should strive as much as possible to improve the databases, I think we should also rely on theory. And I think that the stories about structural transformation, I don't think is in doubt. Why? Because, well, because there's been China's buying a lot of iron ore and petrol and uh, so on and so forth. So, so these have clearly have an inequalizing effect. The fact that agriculture has risen in a few countries, unfortunately, not in all countries, this is also out of the doubt. The fact that the human capital, uh, the secondary education has risen less than what it has, this is a, clearly has an inequalizing effect. The fact that if population growth goes on at 3% a year, this will have a very strong uh, disequalizing effect. The fact that urbanization has proceeded the way it has with the fall in manufacturing is not only due to institution, it's due to trade liberalization. I mean, Africa has deindustrialized when the tariff rate has been falling. So this has to do with macroeconomic policy. So that is, so that th there are a number of things which one has to take into account, which are not strictly related to data to tell the story. And that they seem to be more or less, uh, seems to me, I mean, with all the cautions, because Af uh, Francois Bourguignon told me on, for Africa and Latin America on inequality, you, can, I don't say, you cannot say anything. I, 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 I disagree with him. Now, on Vladimir's, they say, well, growth is, uh, when, when, I, when you have growth, you always have inequality. Well, I mean, first of all, in Africa, you have 70% of the population in agriculture, and there are two models. There is the Lewis model, you move people out of agriculture, they go to a higher productivity sector, and then inequality will rise, national inequality will rise. But then there is another model, which is called the Rani's Fay model, which means you increase yields and incomes in agriculture, and so you reduce the urban-rural income gap, and then basically you start moving people. So this is what's happening in uh, Ethiopia. And so I think that, in a way, there are one or two or three examples in Africa which show that it's not unavoidable. I mean, and if you take the, East, the Southeast Asian tigers, I mean, Taiwan, Singapore, and so on and so forth, and Hong Kong, I mean, they grew very fast with flat inequality. So I think I know that the majority of the cases, uh, inequality like China and the Soviet Union and Russia, sorry, they, they brought that. But uh, it's not, it's not God-given. Thank you. Okay, so let me just say one minute of a few words of conclusion because I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, it's coffee break time. Um, in, in listening to, to the, oh, first of all, let me just clarify on I2D2 since Andrea mentioned it and both Kathleen and I worked on I2D2 for a while. Um, it, it would have been IIDD, so it's I2D2 and it's International Income Distribution Database, but there are so many IDDs already that we thought we'd use, as Haroon correctly guessed, a Star Wars analogy, and called it I2D2 in reference to the cute little robot R2D2 that you may remember. Uh, but I don't want to end on that note. I, want <laughs> <laughs> I do want to end on a, on, a, on a grander note, and that is to say that uh, 10 years ago, when a number of us were involved in writing this, this little world development report on equity and development, I had a bit of an exchange with Paul Collier, and um, Stefan Durkon, I think Stefan is around uh, later today, who were telling me, look, for Africa, forget inequality. It's all about growth. And maybe they were right then, maybe they weren't. But I think what this panel highlights today, and the fact that there are so many of you here uh, uh, participating, is that actually, if, if that was ever right, it's probably no longer right. Um, the relationship between growth and poverty reduction in Africa is mediated by inequality, as it is elsewhere. Uh, and there's a lot of need for greater understanding. Um, I think the panelists here 
have made a huge contribution in, in, in beginning to move us along the path towards a better understanding of, of inequality in Africa. But I cannot help, as someone who's also looked at this question in Latin America a lot, to feel that in this region, um, there's more work to be done still. We're probably earlier in the process. Uh, if you think, for example, of, of Nora Lustig and, and, uh, and uh, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva's book, as well as Andrea's other book on inequality in Latin America, uh, which he says is much better. Uh, but there, 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 there is more of a consensus and a little more clarity. Africa, because of the bifurcation, because of the data challenges, because of the differences across the region, presents a much greater analytical challenge. But because of the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning and others have highlighted as well, uh, to do with the importance, the centrality of Africa for any development uh, goal going forward, including the SDGs they're about to sign. It's fundamental that we make efforts, both on the data and analytical dimensions that have been discussed, um, so that in the 35th anniversary uh, of WIDER, we know even more than these uh, panelists have regaled with today. With that, let me thank them very much and thank you for coming. <laughs>